It is time for us to begin. We do appreciate your being here. Sorry we're a minute or two late. Uh, got detained. It's good to see each of you here. I uh, appreciate so much those that join us online. There are a number that do. I was thinking as I was driving here this morning that it's pretty pretty amazing to me that you can get up uh, other side of Houston, Texas this morning and teach a Bible class in Athens, Alabama tonight. But what's even more amazing to me than that is that you can teach a Bible class tonight and somebody around the world can watch it and listen to it so, and be a part of it. And that, that always amazes me. But uh, I know there are a number who do join us online that are not able to get out at night. Uh, and I do appreciate that very much and uh, hope that our lessons can be beneficial to all of us. <clears throat> we will, as we normally do, begin with prayer and then we will get into our, our Bible study. Our Father, we're thankful that we can be here this evening. We just pray, Lord, that you'll help us to want to live for you and serve you. And we pray that you'll help us as we study from these Old Testament lessons that will benefit by knowing more about you and knowing more about your dealing with mankind and help us to see the faith of those that are faithful and help us to learn from the sin and the mistakes of those that are not faithful. Father, we're mindful of those that are sick and those that are taking treatments, those that have had surgeries, and just pray for each one. We know that several in our number here that are sick and, and are facing various things, and we pray for your healing and your strength and pray for your wisdom and pray that you'll guide us and use us in your service. We pray uh, that you'll help us in our class tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Okay, we are answering the questions on page 65 in the workbook. We are studying the rise of a new king as the lesson, uh, number 11. It is dealing with David. Uh, we've talked about King Saul, who was the first king of Israel. Uh, and then we uh, talked about his son Jonathan quite a bit. And, and he divides up the lessons and sort of does some, skips some, does some more, skips some, and so on. And, and I don't understand why I did that. To me, that makes it more confusing rather than giving you a, 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 some continuity in a continuous story. But anyway, that's the way it is, and that's why we're doing it. So we're looking at King David as uh, he has been anointed as king by Samuel, and yet he does not take over as king immediately. Saul has been rejected by God, but God left Saul in as king for a number of years after uh, he told him he was rejected. And so uh, David it just waits until it's time for him to take over. Uh, we've talked about already how that David had opportunity on at least a couple of different occasions to, to actually kill King Saul, but he refused to do that or harm him because he was the Lord's anointed. Uh, and David is trying to do what's right. He's trying to wait on God and let God take care of him. And and so this is what we're in, and this is what we're studying and so on. And we've talked about it a whole lot. We've discussed the, the story part, and we're answering the questions on page 65. And we're ready for question number three. Uh, what was David's first job in Saul's house? Okay, as a musician, yeah. You remember King Saul, after the Lord left him, it says that an evil spirit came on him, and he would, he would have these... Uh, attacks I, that's the only way I know how to put it uh, and and he would uh, they they suggested you get somebody that can play uh, music and maybe it will help you calm you down and so they found David who was uh, played the harp and he was a real good musician and so they got David to come in and this is the one we discussed about the chronology of it exactly how it takes place because it seems that David is playing for Saul, and Saul knows him, and Saul loves him, and cares about him. And then a couple of chapters later, Saul's saying, who is this guy? <laughs> and, and we talked about the possibility of not mem his memory maybe not being right because of the evil spirit, or maybe the chronology is not exactly the, in order uh, as we go through. I don't know which it is. Uh, but anyway, all right, so he was, first of all, he began as a musician, but then he was appointed as what? As an armor bearer, yeah. Now, an armor bearer would put you in a, about as close a position to a king as you could possibly get. 
because he's going to depend on you to keep somebody from killing him. You're, you are his personal bodyguard. Uh, and, and so that's, that's something that was uh, really a, a big, it's a big thing for him to be appointed as, as an armor bearer. A soldier's life often depended upon blank and blank of his armor bearer, upon the courage, courage and faithfulness. Okay, and that's, that's what he says here in the workbook on page 65 and uh, in paragraph 3 up here just above here. Uh, he, he says that uh, David is this kind of a guy. He's, he's very courageous and, and so on. Now, it was after this then uh, that David goes out to fight against Goliath. And, of course, that's the story that we learn as little kids and most people are, are familiar, at least to some extent, of the, the story of David going out to fight against the giant uh, Goliath. When Goliath came out and he, char he challenged the army of Israel, and David just happened to be there visiting his brothers, uh, and, and David reacted, uh, his reaction, that's question number five, what was David's reaction to Goliath's challenge of Israel? Okay, he was surprised that none of the soldiers of Israel would accept the challenge. That was one thing. But now, Goliath is, if, if our numbers are correct here, Goliath is over nine feet tall. He's a huge guy. Uh, and, I mean, his armor was such that probably most of us couldn't even carry it. And, and so he's, he's a tremendously big guy. But why would David be surprised then that, you know, these normal people wouldn't want to go fight this huge giant? I mean, would you want to go fight, fight a giant? <laughs> I, I think that that would, it would be a normal reaction that they would not want to. But, but why did that bother David? Why was he surprised at that? Oh, they're God's people. And so David took the challenge that Goliath was issuing as a challenge against who? It was a challenge against God. David wasn't concerned about David. He didn't care about, you know, he wasn't worried about his brother. He was worried about the fact that, that this heathen guy is coming out here and he's cursing and mocking and challenging God. And, and, and the dignity and the power of God. And, and so he insists by this. I mean, this just really tears him up. And, and he said, you know, this, this shouldn't be. Uh, and so he says, you know, I'll, I'll go fight him. And he tells King Saul, I'll go fight Goliath. And Saul tries to put some armor on him and give him a sword and all that. And he says, no, I don't want all that stuff. And, and so he... He takes his sling and he gets five smooth stones and he goes out uh, to fight, to fight uh, Goliath. How did David answer Goliath's taunts? When, when he started meeting him, they, this made, it made Goliath mad because here's this little kid coming out there to fight him, or at least he calls him that. I'm not sure he really was a, a kid so much, but he, he's, he's a young guy and obviously not a seasoned soldier. Uh, not a warrior and, and so and he don't even have any armor on he doesn't have a sword in his hand or you know he just comes out with a stick in one hand and a sling in the other and, and so that really made Goliath mad and so he begins telling all the things he's going to do against David and the army of Israel and all that how did David answer Goliath's taunts? Okay he said, this day the Lord's going to give you in my hand. Not only did he tell him that, he said, I'm going to cut your head off and the birds there will eat your flesh. And not just you, but the whole army of the Philistines. And so, to whom did David attribute the victory then? Who was he saying was going to win the battle? God was, yeah. He's saying God's going to win this battle. David, you don't ever see where David... Is saying I'm on. I'm going to do it on my own. Other than with Nabal that we talked about last week, uh, but when he goes out to fight, normally his reaction is, 
I'm going out to fight for God and God's going to win this battle because God told him to go do it. All right, when the crowds began to cheer David, and this is after the victory against the Philistines, the armies are coming back into the city, uh, and so they begin to cheer David. What did Saul quickly realize concerning Samuel's prophecy? Okay, he saw that David was loved by the people. What was Samuel's prophecy that he's talking about here? Okay, yeah, that uh, he's, he told him that, that they, he didn't tell him who, but he told him you're going to be replaced as king. It didn't take Saul very long to figure out it was David, and he knew that. But Samuel told him that God's going to take the kingdom away from you. He's going to give it to somebody else that's uh, got a heart set on serving God uh, because Saul had been disobedient and he wasn't willing to to do what God told him to do. So he, uh, he, the people began to cheer uh, when they came back in and they said that uh, Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. And so Saul began to realize very quickly uh, that David is the one who's going to take over probably. I doubt that he knew it for sure, but I think he began to strongly suspect it at this point. Uh, and he also realized uh, that his, his popularity was diminishing very quickly as king. How did David respond to Saul's two attempts on his life? At least two different times, Saul threw a spear at David and tried to kill him. And how did David respond to that? All right, he, he, he fled, yeah, he ran away. Uh, and, and, he, and I think that's interesting because if somebody threw a spear at you, what would you do? You'd run. Bruce would get the spear and throw it back at him. <laughs> if he missed him, he'd get the spear and throw it back. That would be a natural reaction for a man, uh, I, I think. Is you know, if somebody threw a spear at you and they missed, you grab the spear and throw it back at him. Uh, but but David didn't do that. He left. Uh, and and again, I think this shows the heart that he had. Because he trusted God to take care of him. Saul was king, but, but God was going to be on his side and take care of him. So uncertain about his future, David fled as a blank to the city of blank. He fled as a fugitive to the city of Nob. Okay. Uh, and, and I'm not so sure that he was going to Nob to go to Nob. He was just going by Nob on the way to where where he was going and so he stops by there and, and the priest uh, Ahimelech is there uh, and so he stops you remember and he asked him for some food he gave him the showbread and he gave him uh, Goliath's sword and we, we talked about that uh, some already uh, let's turn the page over to page 68 who helped David when he came to the house of God I just told you the answer to that one Okay, God did, but who was the priest there? Ahimelech. Ahimelech. Okay, so Ahimelech is the priest and, and probably the high priest uh, being there at the house of God. So I, I think this is probably the tabernacle and probably uh, he is the high priest. And so uh, it may not be, it may be that it was some other place uh, that is referred to as the house of God. But normally that would refer to, to the tabernacle at this point because the temple had not yet been built. Uh, and so Ahimelech, if he was in charge there, he would have been probably the high priest. Uh, what did Ahimelech give David? It says when Doeg recognized him, but I don't think the fact that Doeg recognized him had anything to do at all with what he gave him. He gave him bread to eat, first of all, but what else did he give him? Okay, he gave him the sword of Goliath. When uh, David had killed Goliath, he had brought the sword, he had put it there in the house of God, uh, and so Ahimelech, he asked uh, Ahimelech, he said, do you have any kind of a sword or anything? He said, the only thing I've got is I've got the, uh, the sword that you used to kill Goliath, his, his sword. And so he said, there was not one any better than that, let me have it. And so he brought it to him. Uh, and it was, it was sort of stashed, we might say, or stored under the ephod. Uh, and, and that's where, where it was. 
And so where did David go from now? Do what? Achish. Achish. No, no. He goes to, I'm sorry, what did you say? Gath, yes. Yes, Gath. The king is Achish, yeah. He goes to Gath. Now, Gath, is, as we mentioned, is one of the five major cities of the Philistines. They are the arch enemy of the Israelites. David just got through leading a big part of the army to fight against the Israelites and defeated them. So it hadn't been very long now, and David is the commander of part of the army that's fighting against the Philistines and, and slaughtering them. Now he goes down to the land of the Philistines, to the city of Gath, and he goes into Achish. And so uh, the, the king says, hey, this, is, this guy is the one that's going to be king in Israel. Uh, we, we don't want him down here. And so David recognized right quickly uh, that this wasn't going to go over too good. So he began to act like he was crazy, and he began to let spit run down his beard and act, act like he was crazy. And, and uh, King Achish said, well, this guy's a fool. Get rid of him. And so they ran him out, and he left because he recognized right quickly that that was not going to work there. Um, who joined David in the wilderness west of the Dead Sea? And I think that what he's asking for here is a place called Ziph, is the name of the place, and who was it that joined him there? Jonathan did. Okay, the son of Saul. And this is the last time that David and Jonathan saw each other. Now, if you back up a little bit, because uh, that's in chapter 23, if you back up to chapter 22, the cave of Adullam, which is very near Ziph, is where Abiathar, the son uh, of Ahimelech, who had been killed by Saul. You remember King Saul killed Ahimelech, the priest, and, and uh, was it 80 of the other priests with him? And, uh, and so his son Abiathar escaped, and he brought the ephod with him, and he came down to where David was uh, at the cave of Adullam and, and met with him there. So... Uh, it's a possibility you may have had that answer if you did from, from chapter uh, 22, then that's, well, no, Ziph is, is 22. Uh, and then chapter 23 is Jonathan, uh, let me back up, I'm sorry. Jonathan is Ziph, and that's chapter 23. Abiathar is chapter 22, the cave of Adullam. Okay. All right, are you thoroughly confused? Uh, I had it written down, I still got confused. All right. David had two opportunities to kill Saul near the fortress of blank. In Geta. Okay. Near in Geta. Uh, and, and so... Um, why, why did David not kill him? Yeah, he's God's appointed. He's God's anointed. And so he said, I'm not going to kill him. He said, when God, in fact, uh, Abishai, who was one of his top three commanders in his group, uh, in fact, we'll study later a lot about Joab. And Abishai is Joab's brother. As there was Joab, Abishai, and Asahel, were three brothers. And they were like the top three men. Joab was the head man, but Abishai and, and Ahithophel were also, not Ahithophel, that's not his name, Abishai. Anyway, it's three of them, and they, they were brothers, and, and so Abishai is the one that wanted to kill him, and he said, no, he's, uh, he's the Lord's anointed, and we, we're not going to kill him, and so he... He refused to allow him to kill him. Remember the second time he had the opportunity and he was, uh, he told him, he said, if you'll just let me strike him with my spear, it won't take one, one time. I hit him one time, he'd be dead. <laughs> uh, Saul's promise not to kill David is ensured when David returned where? Where? 
Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's the only answer I could come up with. In chapter 27, is David uh, leaves and he goes back down to the Philistines to get. Now, there's been a period of time. Uh, and I think the Philistines recognize that David is being uh, hunted by King Saul. You know, they, they know what's going on and, and they recognize that David is a fugitive. And so David, he takes his family down to Moab and then he goes to Gath and he asked him if he can live there and he t asked him for a city and he told him he could have it. Uh, and so he gave him a city called Ziklag uh, and David and his people then lived uh, in, in Ziklag and, and that's in chapter 27 and I find that interesting that David would go back there and I'd really never even it had never dawned on me that it was the same place that he had been where he acted like he was crazy and got run off but it's the same place and the same king uh, in, in both instances and now uh, Achish takes him in and, and you know says okay you can live here and uh, and so he actually uh, wanted to promote him to his body armor or, or as his armor bearer he wanted to, uh, you know he used him uh, as as his friend and, and thought that David was loyal to him uh, we talked about that some last week what is the nationality of the man who killed Saul okay and of course there's there's a question in my mind there whether or not that statement's even true. Uh, did this Amalekite really kill King Saul? I, I don't think so. Uh, I, I think because if you go back and you look and you read the story, it says that Saul fell on his own sword and killed himself and his armor bearer saw that he was dead and when he did then the armor bearer fell on his sword and killed himself. Now, given that story, and I assume that's correct, I mean, that's the way it's told. So when the Amalekite comes along, he says, well, Saul was, you know, he was trying to kill himself and it wasn't working and he wanted to die and so I killed him. Uh, he's, he's making that up. Why would he do that? Why would he tell David? Okay, if David is a fugitive from King Saul and David is going to be the next king, and, and this guy kills the king that's there, then obviously David's going to be happy about that and David's going to probably reward him uh, and, and give him some kind of special position because after all, he helped him uh, kill the king uh, that was there. Uh, that is not uh, what happened. What happened? Okay, he, he had him killed. Yeah, he had him killed. He said, you have killed the Lord's anointed. Your blood is on your own head. And he had him killed uh, because he was the one uh, who had killed uh, King Saul. All right, any questions on any of that? We, we go, we're going to go back now to the activity page on page 67. Uh, any, any questions anybody got now? All right. Which answer fits? When David arrived at Nob, what did he claim to be doing? Okay, that's B. Uh, he said, I'm on a secret mission from the king and I was in a hurry and uh, we didn't, we didn't have, any, have time to get any food and bring with us and we're hungry and I didn't bring any weapons and so I need some food and I need a sword and so he gave him uh, the showbread and he ate that and, uh, and, and he in, in this book he seems to me to think and believe and leave the impression that, that David did wrong in eating the showbread However, it seems to me when it's brought up by Jesus to the Pharisees that Jesus says that David was justified in doing that. So I, 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 have, to, I have to side with Jesus on that one. Uh, 
All right, a certain man saw David at Nob. Who was he? Okay, Doeg the Edomite. Uh, and, and he would just happen to be there. Uh, David later told Abiathar, the son of Amalek, after Saul had killed his father and he had killed all these other priests uh, and, and all the families of the priests as well. He didn't just kill the priests, he killed all their families as well. Destroyed the whole city of Nob. Uh, and, and so uh, he told him, he, he said, I was, he said I, I was afraid this would happen. It's all my fault. I, I should have known that Doeg would do this. And so uh, Doeg, again, was, he was trying to find favor with King Saul. And uh, he, he thought by doing this, Saul was all upset because nobody would uh, help him find David. And they were trying to help David instead of helping him. And, you know, he's feeling sorry for himself and all that. And uh, as a result of it, Doeg says, well, I can tell you I saw him down there with, talking to the priest of Himalek in the city of Nob and he gave him food to eat and he gave him a sword and, and so Saul killed uh, all of them for that. We've already talked about uh, number three, David obtained a weapon while at Nob which consisted of what? A Goliath's sword, okay. Yeah, he, he took Goliath's sword with him. All right, number four, after leaving Nob, David fled to which king? G. Achish of Gath. Okay, he fled to the city of Gath, and King Achish was the the king there. Uh, and in order to escape from this king, though, David pretended to be what? Number five. Insane. Insane. Okay. Now this is the story in chapter twenty one, uh, and and so he, you know, he, he Achish is very suspicious, and he says, "Hey, this guy, you know, he's he's down here, and he's going." fight against us and he's already you know this is the guy they've been talking about how many Philistines he's been killing <laughs> we've heard about him and, and he didn't want to have anything to do with him well David heard him saying all that and so he began to pretend that he was insane and, and so they ran him off and he left and that was the end of that uh, while Saul was pursuing David David managed to cut off a portion of Saul's robe without him knowing what was Saul doing at the time? Okay, F, he was sleeping. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it, it's interesting because this is one of those things where it specifically tells us, I mean, if you think about it for a minute, if, if you had, you know, an army and they're out in the field and you had the king that was there, and you've got his bodyguard, uh, his armor bearer, his commander in chief, or his commander of the army that's there with him, and that was Abner. Uh, and it says Abner was sleeping around him. So, I mean, he was right there with him. Plus, you know, there was a whole bunch of others, and the king was in the middle of the whole army where he was asleep. So, I mean, he was protected. So, how in the world was David able to get in through all those people? he and Abishai without waking up. <laughs> he was pretty quiet, okay. Actually, it says, this is, this is what I really brought it all up for, because it specifically says that God put a deep sleep on them. Uh, and so this is one of those instances where God intervenes and we know for sure that he did. A lot of times God intervenes. We don't know for sure if it was God did that or not. Uh, you know, and things happen, and especially in our lives today, we don't have any way of, you know, God doesn't tell us. And God didn't tell David that he did that, I don't think. But he did, and so it made David's mission possible to do what he did uh, because God put this deep sleep on, on the army and on Saul and on Abner and so on. All right, David's wife Abigail was at one point married to whom? Nabal, okay. And Nabal, you remember, is, his name means fool. Uh, he's the one that was very foolish in his response to David when David asked him for help uh, and to give him, he and his men, some, some food. And 
He told him he wasn't going to give him anything. And so David, and this is, this is a rare instance in the life of David. I mentioned a while ago when David went out to fight, it was always for the honor of God. It was, it was to obey God or it was to glorify God or to honor God. But on this occasion, who was David thinking about? He was thinking about David, wasn't he? That's all he cared about was David. He, Nabal made him mad, and he slighted him. And he had, he had gone out of his way to be nice to Nabal's men. He had helped them. Uh, he had protected them. Uh, he had made sure that, that, you know, and you have to understand these shepherds out there like that, most of the time they were not armed. They didn't have a, you know, some of them might carry a sword, but usually they didn't. Uh, and, and so they're not armed, and yet, yet you have these groups of bandits that go through the countryside and so on, and, and it wasn't uncommon for that to happen. And they'd come in and they'd steal some of their sheep or sometimes even harm the, the shepherds themselves. And it wasn't anything the shepherds could do much about it. They, they were sort of helpless out there in the field with sheep like that. But David had protected them. And he said, we, he's been like a wall around us, and we've not lost a single sheep since he's been here. And so they knew that David had protected them. And, and, and so when David asked them to you know, share some of what they were doing when they threw this big feast, uh, and he asked for, for him to share some of the food, then it really made David mad. And he was going to go up there and he was going to kill Nabal and all of his men and just get rid of them. And Abigail, Nabal's wife, found out about it, you remember, and she went and uh, interceded on behalf of, of her husband and, and appeased David. And David calmed down. And he said, I'm glad you came and did that because I would have done wrong. I, I would have done it. Uh, and it would not have been right for me to do that. And so then God struck Nabal and he died. And so then David sent for Abigail and uh, Abigail came and married him. So or he married Abigail. Or any, any question or comment on that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right. I had I I was thinking that he took part of the robe both times. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you're right, you're right. I I was thinking uh in chapter 26, that he did cut off a piece of his robe too, and that's why I didn't catch that. But yeah, you're right, Eric. Yeah, no, it, it says he took his jug of water and his spear in 26. So when he was asleep that time in 26, uh, yeah, he's got the two stories mixed up. He took the jug of water and his spear in chapter, and it doesn't in chapter 24. It just says he went in to relieve himself and. Uh, David and his men were sitting in the inner recesses of the cave. Uh, and David rose and cut off the edge of Saul's robe secretly and, and so on. So yeah, that's, uh, that, that is true. Sorry about that. I, I didn't catch that one. Yeah, he's got the two stories mixed up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think, hang on just a minute. For some reason, I'm thinking,
It talks about the I was trying to see if he do what? No, I was I was thinking that in the book he said that he was asleep when he was in the cave. Uh, but I can't find the story part of it where it even says anything about him being in the cave. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I saw I saw that one. Yeah. Yeah, do what? Yeah, and he doesn't mention the first instance at all, I don't think, in the book. I, for some reason, I thought that I had read that he did. After you mentioned that, I, I got to thinking about it. Uh, but I guess he didn't. Uh, anyway, but anyway, what, what Eric said is correct, that these two are mixed up in this question. It should have just been, uh, he was not sleeping then, but he was the other time. All right, Jonathan meets David for the last time in where? D in Ziph. David fled to the king of Achish who gave him a city to dwell in. What city was it? K, Ziklag, okay. And we, we talked about that, and, and uh, it's, it just seems strange to me that of all the places to go in the Philistines, uh, number one, why would he even go down to the Philistine country? And number two, I guess because it's close. Uh, but number two, why would he go back to Ziklag uh, or go back to Achish, king of Gath, when he's already been there one time and it didn't work, you know? Uh, Saul and his sons died at which place? Mount Gilboa. What did the Philistines do with Saul's body? Okay, hung it on from the wall on the city. And what did David do? The man who can the man who confessed to killing Saul. Oh, he killed him. Okay, had him killed. All right. Uh, all right. Any question? That sort of hurrying through the last ones, but we've spent enough time on this lesson. We'll, we'll go next week, Lord willing, to question to lesson number twelve. Uh, and begin there next next week.
We'll start by singing number 66 in the big book. Number 66. <clears throat>
If I ask you tonight, are we okay, that takes attention away from you, doesn't it? Whatever is hurting you right now, I say, are we okay? Is there one other person in this room that you know how they are doing? Are they okay? Are they sick? You know, what's their problem in this life right now? So it's a good question to ask, especially a good question for married people, young and old married, and I'll tell you why here in a little bit. True story. Husband and wife got into a real good argument, and he was the kind of person that he could just kind of let it go, get happy real quick, and sleep well that night. She wasn't that way. She was ready to fester a little more, dwell on a little more the next morning. So the next morning, he got ready to go to work. And she was questioning, you know, I'm still mad at you. But he said, well, I had to go do my job. I had to take care of things. And as Matt said in his lesson Sunday morning, she had a change of heart. And this part is what the married people need to listen to. Are we okay? You need to ask your spouse that, you know, you're really mad at each other. Can we say, are you okay? If you don't ask, it's going to fester and fester and fester. And then you'll say, well, she's going to say that, he's going to say that, and I'm going to say this. And before you know it, they're getting divorced. And for what reason? Just because they didn't ask, are you okay? So applying this to your spiritual life, are we okay? That happens to both Christians and non-Christians alike. Life has made you do some errors, and you need to really repent of them. You're not quite okay. As a non-Christian, of course, we don't know when you're going to pass away. None of us do. So you need to be prepared. You're not okay. So we give you this opportunity right now. I know I'm short, but are you okay? If not, let us pray for you and help that situation out. Come to Jesus, he will save
worse than with it set 10 o'clock. Uh, are there any announcements that need to be made at this time? I do have one announcement. Uh, Kathy Rogers' brother-in-law uh, passed away this week, and uh, they live in Vernon, Alabama, and uh, their funeral is tomorrow, so if we can keep Kathy Rogers and her family in our prayers, uh, they would appreciate that. Brother, yes, how, many, how many do we have? 39. How many was it? 39, okay. And uh, as all of you know, we went up to MD Anderson in Houston, and basically the doctor there agreed with what we were being told here, uh, same procedure. Uh, they, they, narrowed, they were sort of giving us like five different options here. They narrowed it down to two out there, either have the whole surgery, major stuff done, or don't do anything. Uh, and so uh, we got to look at a lot of different things. But Diane was scheduled for a scan yesterday. She did not get the scan done yesterday. So she'll be getting that done sometime in the near future here. So, uh, But we're probably at this point, we're not sure what we're going to do where. But uh, anyway, that's that's what we know at this point. We want to let everybody know what's going on. Appreciate your prayers, and please continue to pray. There's nothing further. Brother Eric will lead us in our closing prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're again thankful to you for this day you've given us, for this opportunity we've had together and assembled together this evening to study your word. We pray, Father, that we gain much good by the studies that we've had tonight, that we lifted up your name and, uh, in prayer and in song and from hearing your word spoken. Father, we pray again for those that are sick and pray your blessings on them, especially for Sister Diane at this time. Likewise, Father, for those who are grieving, we pray your comfort upon them. Father, we pray that you'll be with us as we leave here and be with us in the remainder of the week as we go out, out into the world. Help us to be a good example to others and shine your light on, on those that may not know about, about you. Forgive us when we do wrong, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Molten lava sparks. Not this Sunday. Next Sunday.